Can you hear me all right? Good. Well, fr dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very honored to have been asked here today to, to talk to you. Uh, my book, Making Dystopia, published by Oxford University Press, received wide reviews, inc including a lot of abuse from the usual quarters, of course. Um, I'd like to remind you about the term, because you, utopia is really an ideal. It's the uh, opposite of dystopia. Dystopia is somewhere you'd never wish to be. And so this talk is about opposites. Uh, something the opposite of what ev everybody has been told. Let's look at what Pugin uh, said in the 1830s. He compared the architecture of his own day by uh, masters of English architecture with the architecture of the Middle Ages, and he found it wanting. And in this respect, I often think that architectural criticism has been tarnished to a certain extent about the Puginian position, which brought in the question of morality and architecture, which is always a dangerous business. I'd like to remind you about one of the most important critics of the 19th century, Coventry Patmore. Very few people have heard of him because he said that the architecture is really a response to gravity, that the post and lintel system or the arc arcuated systems with vaults and buttresses all reflect stability, stability in the force of gravity. And both styles, the post and lintel style, which of course uh, is largely what Greek classicism is all about. Uh, both styles, uh, be it um, post and lintel or arcuated, uh, were compatible geometries and so can coexist. See the English cathedral closes where harmony exists. Medieval, Elizabethan, Baroque, Georgian, Victorian arts and crafts all respond to the Coventry Patmore test of what is real architecture. And architecture which does not respond to gravity cannot be regarded as architecture, according to him. Well, I took the decision to look at Pugin again. <laughs> and instead of um, taking the architecture which Pugin uh, looked at, I looked at a collection of 20th century architecture, blobism, deconstructivism, pilotes, a sub-Corbusian block, and other familiar modernist elements. I weighed them against a selection of classical works of architecture by John Nash, Robert Smirk, and others, and found it unworthy. Once it was the architect's job to create order out of chaos. Now architects create chaos where once there was order. This is the high street of Belfast in Ireland, as it was round about 1910. I think this was probably round about the time of the coronation of George V, and it shows tramways just recently electrified, a typical 19th century street of a series of verticals. Vertical windows, classical ornamentation, and look what happens. The same street now. Modernism cuts across the grain, destroys harmony with buildings, it adds alien geometries, and it deliberately creates horizontal elements where everything else historically was vertical. Mm. 
And then there was the malign influence of certain supposed architectural historians. Pevsner, for example, said that uh, Art Nouveau began in the 1880s. These piers in London supporting railway stations and a road date from the 1860s, 20 years before Pevsner said Art Nouveau began. And Pevsner, Pevsner's work is full of this kind of misrepresentation. He tries to make out, first of all, that um, modernism has to be a tabula rasa, and then he says it has respectable antecedents in the arts and crafts period. He says there's not one element in this building that is historical. It's not true. There are elements from Lutyens, there are elements from vernacular architecture in Dorset and in Somerset, and much else. There's also uh, the question of Art Nouveau, which again, I say, began in the 1860s, not the 1880s. And it's astonishing that Pevsner also claimed that certain named arts and crafts architects, such as Bailey Scott and Voisey, were pioneers of the modern movement. Some uh, commentators have gone so far as to look at it, an atelier by Eusenfant and uh, uh, Corbusier, which I show on the right, compare that with the Bailey Scott interior on the left, because of the little protrusion on the left is clearly derived from Bailey Scott, Pevsner tells us. This is an absurdity. And Bailey Scott himself objected vehemently to this. He said that you cannot do this to me. You're ruining my reputation. You're slandering me. And then he did it to Voisey too. Pevsner said that this house um, that you see on the left with its bow windows comes amazingly close to the 20th century concrete and glass grid. Voisey said again to Pevsner, you're libeling me. You're trying to make out that a deeply felt work of architecture has uh, the same antecedents as the work of the godless Gropius, and the godless Mies van der Rohe. And he made the point about godlessness. William Morris and C.F.A. Voisey were claimed by the apologists for modernism as progenitors of it. This is fantastically unlikely to anyone with eyes to see. And Voisey explicitly detested modernism, saying it was pitifully full of faults, it was vulgarly aggressive. And Pevsner, who called in that pernicious book for architecture to be, and I quote, totalitarian, insisted that Voisey was a precursor of modernism, thus implying he knew better than the creator of the architecture what his work was all about. So the widely accepted narrative of modernism a la Gropius is that it was some kind of logical or ineluctable development. Is it not working? Oh, sorry. Have, am I, am I, have you not been hearing what I said? Oh. Some kind of uh, logical and ineluctable um, development from the arts and crafts movement. And this seems to me to be utterly fantastic. It's like saying that Mickey Spillane is a logical or ineluctable outgrowth of Montesquieu. Each artistic product which has to be as as assessed aesthetically on its own merits, which is in architecture, has to include its harmony with an existing townscape. And only someone who sees with an ideology 
rather than with eyes, could conclude anything other than that modernism has been overwhelmingly a disaster. And claiming respectable ancestors is somewhat at variance with equal claims to be starting from zero, as Gropius put it. But such a contradiction is hardly noticed by the grand narrative history of modernism. Horizontal windows. We're told that uh, that, of course, derives from historical development. But in fact, these windows are all broken up by structural mullions. So there is a difference. And on the bow windows of Boise, there were also historical precedents for that as well. In timber and in stone. A timber framed a building in the city of London, now demolished, but in, you can see it in the Victoria and Albert Museum and 17th century bay windows at Kirby Hall in Northamptonshire. And again, peering myopically through his Bauhaus tinted spectacles, Pevsner was convinced about the horizontality of windows in 16th century timber framed Little Morton Hall in Cheshire, which you see on the left. And the work of Deavy, George Deavy at Penshurst, Kent, if you look at the uh, window on the right-hand picture, which turns a corner, uh, Pevster said that Gropius invented that in 1914. He didn't. D.V. used it many years earlier. And Berlacher objected to being called a modernist also. At a conference in the 1920s, Berlacher said, uh, refused to have his photograph taken with a group of modernist architects, saying, you're ruining my life's work and I want nothing further to do with you. He refused to be included in that photograph. And one can see why. All the buildings of this famous merchant's exchange, uh, uh, all the details of the construction, the vaulting, it all stems logically from historical precedent. So let's look at some of the, we might call them the unholy trio or unholy trinity of um, modernism. Gropius, Ludwig Mies, and Jean Charles Edouard Jeanneret Gris, who of course called himself Le Corbusier, just as Stalin gave himself a uh, uh, a moniker and Lenin too. Modernists were adept at claiming that their architecture was a logical development to an aesthetic successor of classical Greek architecture and yet utterly new and unprecedented. The latter, of course, is nearer the mark. They, they created buildings that not only in theory but in actual practice were incompatible with all that went before. Um, any single one of their buildings uh, could and often did lay waste a townscape with devastating consequences. And so what had previously been a source of pride for inhabitants became a source of impotent despair. Corbusier's books are littered with references to the Parthenon and other great monuments of architectural genius but how anybody can see anything in common between the Parthenon and the Unité d'Habitation, an appellation that surely by itself ought to tell us everything we ought to know about Corbusier, other than that both are the product of human labor, that defeats me. These human beings were so flawed that between them they were an encyclopedia of human vice. They spoke of morality, and they behaved like whores. They talked of the masses and were utter ego egotists only interested in themselves. They claimed, claimed to be principled. They were without scruple, either moral, intellectual, aesthetic, or financial. Their two undoubted talents were those of self-promotion and survival, combined with an overweening thirst for power. <laughs> 
and their intellectual dishonesty was startling and would have been laughable had it not been more destructive. But when they claimed to have no style because their designs were imposed on them by, by history, by technology, by social necessity, by functionality, economy, and so on and so forth, and like Luther, proclaimed they could do no other, which soon became the demand that others could do no other also, they remind me of the logical positivists who claim to have no metaphysic. And Louis Hellman's vision of Corbusier, his vision of dim-witted architects hailing their deity, Le Corbusier, any association with the Parthenon is, of course, completely spurious. Two projects for a monument to Bismarck at Bergen am Bingen, 1910. On the left, by Walter Gropius and Adolf Meyer, mostly Adolf Meyer, because Gropius couldn't draw, and right by Ludwig Mies. So here is Ludwig Mies, who, whose name means something uh, grotty, unpleasant, uh, disagreeable, which is why he changed it, more of that later. And there's not a great deal to choose, is there, between that and this scheme by Wilhelm Kreis, one of the numerous uh, Krieger Ehrenmäler war memorials designed by Wilhelm Kreis between 1941 and 1943 to commemorate the sacrificial death of millions of German soldiers all over Europe after the Greater German Reich had been proclaimed. The architectural language is identical. And of course, we have the work of Behrens, his crematorium at Delston by Herhagen in North Rhine-Westphalia. Behrens was, of course, the master of both Mies and Gropius. He used a stripped classical language, and generally speaking, his great admired masterpiece is the Imperial German Embassy in St. Petersburg, completed in 1913. The job architect was Ludwig Mies. There's not much difference between the architectural language of this and Albert Speer. Ludwig Mies also produced projects on his own account, the uh, Koller House and Gallery in the Netherlands, strongly influenced by people like Schinkel and, and, and other Prussian neoclassicists in the 19th century. And, of course, he also produced traditional classical houses, quite numerous. And if we also linger just before the catastrophe of 1914, we find in what used to be called Breslau, now Wrocław, works by Pelzig. We all know about the building on the left, the office block in the former Junkerstrasse, um, but we are never shown uh, uh, the four domes pavilion which he designed uh, in the same time in a simplified Greek classical style for the great exhibition of 1913, which commemorated the centenary of the Battle of the Nations at Leipzig, when Napoleon was routed. We're also told about the, the newness of Gropius's factory, the Werkbund exhibition in Cologne, uh, in 1914, and in fact, my, with Meyer again. But I'd like you to look at the plans on the left because the um, obvious connection with ancient Egyptian temple architecture is, to my mind, fairly clear. The Ptolemaic temple of, the, of Horus at Edfu, um, some 2,000 years earlier. All change in with 1914 to 1918. Germany became a basket case. There were armed gangs, revolutionary groups. Architects, of course, joined the workers. And 
exhibitions were to be held of modernism. The Russians, of course, also produced their, their constructivist designs, experimental modernism in the new Soviet Union, shape of things to come. We also have a deliberate emphasis on uglification in the, this design for a workers' club in Moscow by Melnikov. Sorry. So we have Gropius sets up a new establishment in Weimar, which is supposed to be based on the influence of Morris and Ruskin. It was to be like the medieval craft guilds, we were told, working craftsmen. It did none of those things. It, in fact, destroyed um, craftsmanship. But it did encourage mystical cults. These are two of the lecturers at the Bauhaus. Um, scientific rationalism, of course. We have the uh, wandering apostle on the left in contemporary costume, as um, Gropius insisted on contemporary costume. And on the right, Johannes Itten, who insisted on giving an enema to his students before uh, the morning lectures to purify them. He also insisted on puncturing them with needles so that uh, all the badness would come out. And of course, with bad hygiene, they got diseases and had to go to hospital. This is scientific rationalism, you understand. Um, cold, objective, scientific rationalism. So what have we got? We, in fact, have the beginnings of a dangerous cult. A dangerous cult can be defined as a kind of false religion. It's the adoption of a system of belief based on mere assertions with no actual factual foundations. It's an excessive, almost idolatrous admiration for a person, persons, an idea, or even a fad. The adulation accorded to Corbusier, for example, accorded almost to the status of a deity in architectural circles. It's just one example. It has certain characteristics, characteristics which can be summarized as follows. It's destructive. It isolates its believers. It claims superior but spurious knowledge and morality. It demands subservience, conformity, and obedience. It's adept at brainwashing. It imposes its own assertions as dogma. It will not countenance any dissent. It's self-referential. Its tame intellectuals are brought on board to construct a grand narrative tailored to suit the story. That is, to create a bogus history to, to convince the dim. And it invents its own arcane language, incomprehensible to outsiders. Obfuscate now, it'll get you to the top. Now, anyone unfamiliar within the workings, within architectural schools who might feel this overstates the case should attend a crit. Read the architectural magazines published from the 1950 onwards or glance at the staccato assertions of the odious pub publications of Le Corbusier and the ecstatic reviews of those publications. Uh, Mies, Ludwig Mies um, found that he could not exhibit his pre-war designs because Gropius and co. disapproved of them. So he had to reinvent himself. He added an umlaut to the E of his first name, so it became Mies, which doesn't mean anything in German, and, and added van der Rohe, which sounds uh, reassuringly Dutch as well as slightly grand. And he emerged as a radical modernist. For the first time in the history of the human race, all ornament was expunged. It wasn't just Ludwig Mies. It was Erich Mendelssohn as well who produced 
some of the most successful commercial architecture of the time uh, with his long bands of or his horizontal windows. But of course, he was ignored by the newly invented Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius because after all, Mendelssohn wasn't a real German, was he? Yet he was probably the most distinguished of those early modernists whose works were copied, became, sorry, became um, influential throughout the world. Uh, there's Simpsons in Piccadilly in London, clearly derived from Erich Mendelssohn. And the famous store in Stuttgart, and when he came to England uh, after the National Socialists came to power, uh, he was employed to design the Dilawa Pavilion at Bexhill on Sea, uh, and his work had enormous impact on the design of cinemas in England in the 1930s. Now, there's a very unedifying story here. Uh, when an exhibition of modern German architecture was proposed at the RIBA in the 1930s, correspondence exists between Gropius and uh, the organizers of the exhibition, and Gropius is assured that only German architects, true German architects, will be allowed to exhibit. And we all know what that means, no Jews. That's where they all are. But yet, these criminals accuse anybody who opposes them of being Nazis. As I shall demonstrate in a moment, it isn't true. However, Gropius and Mies van der Rohe had already nailed their colors firmly to the mast. Uh, Gropius, with his lightning bolt uh, memorial to the victims of the Cap Putsch, who were shot and to the murdered communists by Mies van der Rohe, Karl Liebknecht, and Rosa Luxemburg. Now, the existence of these two monuments to left-wing revolutionaries were not going to endear Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius to the regime which came to power in 1933, even though there was very little to choose between those two left-wing organizations, and I use the term very deliberately. How could the National Socialist German Workers' Party ever be considered to be right-wing, I ask? At Turton in Dessau, Gropius and co. produced their paradise uh, working houses, working class houses at a cooperative building, which did not wear very well. But again, that is very much the shape of things to come. Now, Charles Edward Jeanneret, who, like Stalin, Lenin, and Molotov, adopted a pseudonym, wrote manifestos referring uh, to himself as a sort of pea green, incorruptible, chaste perfectionist, quite separate from a sort of alter ego called Jeanneret. The land was to be freed up for fast cars, and only an obelisk was around, allowed to remain from the Place de la Concorde. This ideal is adopted by CIAM and becomes the model of what's to be compulsory throughout the world. No deviation was permissible. But the reality became hell on earth. Notice the complete destruction of uh, Paris north of the Seine to Montmartre with a series of towers. This, however, is the reality which Corbusier created. Aeroplanes flying dangerously near the tower blocks but the, the, the lower picture shows actually what occurred. Get us out of here. Hell on earth. But although it's obvious the model is a disaster, it's enforced with even greater ferocity. No deviation is permitted. The cult has to be followed to the letter. 
Le Corbusier is deified. He also tinkers with the truth. The upper picture shows a series of grain silos as they are. The lower picture shows what he published. He removed the pitched roofs. We can't have pitched roofs. They are not modern, you know. And he shouts at us. He says, American engineers overwhelmed with their calculations are expiring architecture. It's all slogans. Half-baked slogans by a dangerous lunatic. And he takes, what, where does he take his, his themes from? Ocean-going liners of the Titanic vintage. Ancient aeroplanes, out of date almost before they're flying. And he adds them into architecture. We have the nautical allusions. Corbusier was a fascist in the most literal sense of the word, and early during the occupation advocated the removal by force of the majority of Paris's population because it had no business to be living there. The sheer megalomania of the modernist architects, their evangelical zeal on behalf of what turned out to be and could have been known in advance to be an aesthetic and moral catastrophe is here described in my book. The rapid rise and complete triumph of modernism throughout the world so that an office block in Caracas should be no different from one in Mumbai or Johannesburg is to me still mysterious, considering that its progenitors were a collection of cranks and crackpots who wrote very badly and whose ideas would have disgraced an intelligent schoolboy. I do not see how anyone could read Corbusier, for example, and I have read a fair bit of him, without conceiving an immediate and complete contempt for him as a man, as a thinker, and as a writer. He has two kinds of sentence the declamatory falsehood and the peremptory order without reasons given. Now, anybody who could have taken his bilge seriously is by far the most important inquiry that can be made about him. But perhaps ovine humanity just wants to be led. In the famous Weissenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart, in the late 1920s, organized by Mies van der Rohe, only approved architects were allowed to exhibit. People like Mendelssohn were excluded. And a whole lot of arts and crafts people as well, because they wouldn't conform to the uh, required style. So we've got rendered block work, white painted walls, stripped windows, buildings on stilts, mass produced factory elements, flat roofs. It's called the international style and it was accepted worldwide, no matter what the climatic conditions. So you roasted in hot climates and froze in cold ones. The buildings also leaked and were far more expensive to construct than traditional methods. But the widespread use of this style put craftsmen out of business. And for the first time, as I've said, in the history of the world, an architecture devoid of any ornament was to be forced on everyone. Choice, in other words, was eliminated. And soon results were everywhere. Carl Fieger was actually the executive architect for several buildings claimed to be by Gropius, who, as I've said, couldn't draw. Adolf Meyer was the main collaborator with uh, Gropius for many years and indeed was mostly responsible for his work. That's a design by Figa on the top left. And there were other architects working in the 1920s in Germany. Uh, Tido Schurder, for example, in, in Turingen, and Gropius and Meyer um, built this house at Jena, uh, again in the rather incoherent modernist style. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it, that um, we're given that these official histories of modernism, um, but various people are eliminated. There, there were others, though, um, 
in, 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 the, in the Atlantic Archipelago, as the British Isles are now known, um, there were people of all classes who didn't want to be dictated to by bullying architects, um, who wanted to coerce them into becoming different people. And in England especially, there was an inventive high camp style, uh, aptly described by Osbert Lancaster as Buggers Baroque. Cecil Beaton, Stephen Tennant, the Sitwells were all involved. And I find the, the idea of outrageous gays sending up po-faced, humorless, continental modernist dictators rather amusing. Osbert Lancaster also spotted something after the National Socialists came to power. He, saw, he, he noted that there was not a great deal to choose between the Soviet architecture and National Socialist official architecture, apart from the fact that in the Soviet architecture, capitals were eschewed for ideological reasons. But there was no evidence here of degraded bourgeois taste. Bourgeois being one of the most uh, offensive words the modernists could use uh, against their enemies. Now, we are all told in the grand narratives of modernism that all the modernists of the Bauhaus uh, left Germany when the National Socialists came to power. This, of course, is not true. Here are designs for the Reichsbank competition of 1933 by Gropius, etc., and Mies van der Rohe. Many highly successful uh, modernists did leave. One was Mendelssohn, but he was Jewish, and realized immediately he had no future in the new Reich. Aryans such as Mies and Gropius were prepared to stay. It's also untrue that the Nazis closed the Bauhaus. In fact, they wanted to keep it open. It was Mies van der Rohe who closed it because he realized that its associations with the extreme left, and especially with Bolshevism, were things he felt would be unwise for him to maintain, so he wanted to reinvent himself yet again to ingratiate himself with the new government. We're also told that only classicism of the stripped sort was allowed in Nazi Germany. This is not true. Here is the Heinkel factory of 1935 to 6 by Herbert Rimpel and Josef Bernard, an impeccably modernist essay. For, for official buildings, a certain formalism was thought to be required, such as the 1936 Olympic Stadium by Werner March, something that could easily have come out of the Berners stable. But don't forget that all the democracies were doing that sort of thing at the same time. And here are two more uh, buildings of the Third Reich. The top one is by Albert Speer. These are houses uh, for the workers uh, in, engaged in the building of the Nuremberg Stadium. And the bottom is an apartment block at Berlin Zehlendorf, based on designs by Bruno Taut with a pitched roof instead of a flat one. The statue of a German worker on the left does not suggest right-wing public art. And in Britain, of course, the international style was adopted. Very expensive houses by Connell Ward and Lucas, uh, high and over at Amersham, and a sun house at Highover Park in Buckinghamshire. Walter Gropius had his portrait painted, uh, sorry, that's, I should have. Walter Gropius had his portrait painted by Max Ernst on the left in 1934. I think that sums Gropius up. He also wanted to design these housing blocks overlooking Windsor Castle in 1935. It was designed in cooperation with Maxwell Fry, uh, but uh, permission was refused we're told that the world was not ready for it. <laughs> now, contrary to received opinion, Gropius hardly designed anything. The Bauhaus was mostly designed by Karl Fieger and Ernst Neufeld. 
Um, Figo had worked on the interiors of the embassy of St. Petersburg, and uh, he worked for Gropius until 1934, uh, when, um, and worked on until the 1950s in a similar style. On the right um, is a poster for the Bauhaus exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1938. And it's interesting to see uh, the people who were responsible for the exception, for the acceptance of, thank you very much, of modernism in the States. Philip Johnson, who was a Nazi, who learned German in the horizontal position during the invasion of Poland, and was an associate of Father Cochlan, uh, who was the head of the German Nazis, opposed to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, Johnson wrote vile diatribes for the Nazi party uh, newspaper in America. And he was determined to get um, Gropius and Mies van der Rohe over to the States to promote modern architecture. There was a famous exhibition and a book published, which I show you here, uh, about the so-called international style. Now, although Gropius settled in London in 1934, Mies van der Rohe stayed on in Germany. On the left is a proclamation by all the leading architects and uh, artists of Germany urging people after the death of Hindenburg to give absolute powers to Adolf Hitler. There is down below next to Wilhelm Pinder, who was the tutor of Pefsner, the name of Mies van der Rohe, without the, without the umlaut. And that is his resignation. He didn't leave Germany, as you can see, until he got a good job with Richard Pickings in America, thanks to Philip Johnson. He is resigning from the Prussian Academy of Arts. The date is 1937. You can see the umlaut on his name at the top and the, his signature under Heil Hitler. So this is this wonderful lefty de Democrat who left Germany in 1933 as soon as Hitler came to power. It's a lie. Now, Le Corbusier, of course, wasn't really interested in human beings. He was only interested in abstractions. He even reinvented what human beings should look like so that they could fit into his buildings. He also invented the internal street, a nasty dark corridor where you could easily be mugged. But of course, the idea is multiplied. You, you get imitations of the unité d'habitation scaled down uh, all over the place. London County Council, 1954, uh, based on the same kind of thing. That's one of my own drawings on the right. Uh, when I could still bear to put pen to paper. Now, this is a medieval English town after modernism gets to it. You can see the medieval church, but all the graveyard has been flattened, of course. We can't have death, it's so untidy. And the one surviving building, which is the medieval entrance to the former monastery, is now marooned on a traffic island. Uh, the people are rehoused in blocks with horizontal windows and are forced to use high-level walkways because the whole of the ground is given up to motor cars. So this is the hell on earth. This used to be a beautiful medieval town, but the street has been abolished because Le Corbusier didn't approve of it. It was unhygienic. It's true. He said, that's what he said. It's not hygienic. I have to get rid of it. It's untidy. And it's also humane. I remember uh, when I was considering the, the essential puritanical element of modernism, uh, my friend Roderick Gradage once said, modernism never sold a pint of bitter. How true. <laughs> 
In the period just before 1939, Coventry appointed uh, for itself a, an, a modernist architect planner called Gibson. And Gibson proposed to demolish the medieval city of Coventry and recreate it in a Corbusian image. He must have been very pleased when the Luftwaffe did the job for him. And so we have the reality of post-war um, Coventry. The tower block, which you see on the left, is regarded as a vertical feature to balance the medieval surviving tower of St. Michael's Church, the, which became the cathedral, the only part of the cathedral apart from its walls to survive the incendiary bombs which destroyed it. This architecture is very typical of the sort of thing that was happening in England after the Second World War. It has not worn well. It, most of it is having to be rebuilt. Um, and aesthetically, it's valueless. But all too common. If you compare the central arcade on the left with its Gibsonian equivalent, there really isn't much choice, is there? One is joyous and interesting and inviting, and the other is uh, merely dull. And poor old Canterbury acquired in the shadow of one of the greatest cathedrals in England, uh, post-war development, which was regarded as democratic. And of course, there was plenty of slope space left over after planning, uh, surrounded by broken down chestnut fencing and other nonsenses. This is the kind of hell on earth which was created in the uh, wake of the Second World War. We also have gloomy uh, work in Glasgow, massive blocks of flats where the lifts invariably are used as public lavatories and don't work anyway. Uh, where there's crime and vandalism and all the buildings have to be pulled down within 20 years of being built. This is called scientific rationalism. I don't see how it can have that label. Interestingly, when the Stalin Alley was built according to the principles of the 16 principles of urbanism in East Germany, certain people, such as Richard Paulik and Edward Collin were um, the architects involved. Um, it was quite interesting that certain um, Western architects, including Philip Johnson, rather admired it. It certainly uh, had a more urban appearance than what was happening in West Berlin, which you see in the Hansa Viertel on the right-hand side, which was supposed to be sort of democratic and pleasant. Famous Pruitt Ego by uh, Yamasaki, Minoru Yamasaki, a, a, a huge housing development which had to be dynamited because it was completely beyond redemption. Interesting that the same architect designed the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, which was attacked, of course, as you know, in 2001. The leader of that attack was a graduate in architecture from, the, uh, from Hamburg, who actually loathed what modernism was doing to Aleppo. So it's worthwhile considering that there was a partly, part act of hatred against Western capitalism behind that. Now we return to uh, some of the unfortunate aspects of post-war architecture in England. The demand for the tabula rasa meant that huge numbers of terrace housing uh, were demolished. Uh, uh, the fabric of society in these areas was destroyed in Manchester. And these huge crescents were called to give them an air of respectability, Adam Terrace, Wyatt Terrace, and others, to give them a kind of spurious link with the past. 
And of course, the, the, the press swallowed this nonsense and called it, oh, oh well, the, the modern architects are going to give us the elegance of Georgian crescents and squares. This is what we got. It became quickly the most dysfunctional housing estate in Europe. It was up for 20 years before it was demolished because nobody could live in it. And of course, uh, the architects were honored. One of them became head of the Royal Fine Art Commission. Let's return to Germany for a moment. The 1936 to 8, Herbert Rimpel and Josef Bernard designed the former Hankel Aircraft Factory in Oranienburg, in Brandenburg. Now, that is, in fact, an absolute modernist building, is it not? It is not stripped classical at all. But of course, we have the, the, the Smithsons at Hunstanton building a school derived from Mies van der Rohe's work in America, which cooked the children in summer and froze them in winter. And the glass uh, cr cracked because of the heat. The window frames were metal. Uh, so in fact, the glass failed and the windows failed. And the whole lot had to be replaced. That kind of failure was everywhere. We have the, rep the replacement of the City Terminus Hotel at Cannon Street in London uh, by, by E.M. Barry, the son of the famous Charles Barry. A comparison with the banal uh, curtain-walled office slab by the odious Polson uh, on the right, which replaced it. It's an eloquent demonstration of how the built environment was impoverished once cheap modernism became universally accepted. And here, Polson ended up in jail he worked with uh, a, a, a council in the north of England run by a man called Dan T. Co uh, Two Coats Smith. He called Two Coats because he always uh, quoted for two coats of paint but only used one. And he ended up in jail too. And there were cabinet ministers whose palms had been greased with silver as well so that this sort of horror could take place. The Smithsons, who were, of course, modernist par excellence, designed these, Robin Hood housing. They said that these are based on the elegance of the Georgians of the woods in Bath. These have just been demolished. Again, nobody wanted to, to live in them because they were failing. And when the uh, Stanley Kubrick made the film A Clockwork Orange, he didn't have to build any sets. He used the housing estates of Thamesmead designed by the Greater London Architects Department, which provided him with free sets for the filming of that dystopian, horrible film. Notice the pile of rubbish in the foreground, the upper walkways, which were occupied by muggers, the lifts, of course, which didn't work, and all the rest of it. All this has gone after a very few years. Again, what kind of economic sense does that make? And even in, when this went up, the Centre Pompidou, again, we have to have ventilators from ocean-going ships of the 1920s vintage, but we can't see where the entrance is because entrances are elitist, and you have to see where the queue is before you go, that will tell you how, where to go in. But there's no architectural reason for going to that particular point, unless there's a queue there. Shock horror when in, uh, in America, Philip Johnson built the uh, A&T building, the later the Sony building in New York in the 1970s. Uh, Philip Johnson with John Henry Burgey um, the, there are allusions, certainly, to the um, Pazzi Chapel in, in Florence, which you see in the lower picture. But the, the shock waves that went through the architectural world before this, there were always people having nervous breakdowns because of it. And then we have what's computers got uh, going. Uh, architects could do what they like. With the 
usual results of uh, leaking roofs, junctions that don't work, buildings that overwhelm the, exhi the exhibits and all the rest of it. The deeply impoverished language of Bauhaus or Corbusian architecture became evident even to architects, They're probably the most obtuse professional group in the world. Though educationists are not far behind, but their turning away from the dreariness of Corbusianity has hardly improved matters. They discovered the delights for themselves of originality without the discipline of even a reduced vernacular, of giving buildings outlandish shapes simply because it was possible to do so. The more outlandish, the most attention they are being drawn to themselves. And so they were called starchitects. And so it goes on, pile up after pile up after dreary pile up. Outrageous expense, um, threatening, distorted, making one uneasy. There's enough uneasiness in the world without creating environments for even more. And even in China, the big underpants fell under criticism. Rem Koolhaas's building. And Louis Hellman, I think, captured it rather well. These are sort of deliberate insults on the rest of the world. I wonder, when you look at uh, a vision of Solomon's temple by Hafenreffer on the top left, uh, published in Tübingen in 1613, and you look at the work of a painter, Melvin Charney, uh, showing an interpretation of the same thing with the center of gravity, the crematorium chimney. It's interesting that some of the most uh, successful Bauhaus students designed some of the fabric for the extermination camp at Birkenau. Modernism, of course, has one failure after the other. We have the famous Ronan Point disaster in Canning Town in London in 1968 on the left when a, a gas boiler exploded low, lower down and the whole lot came down above it. And uh, also you clad buildings with uh, stuff that goes on fire, so you get the Grenfell Tower disaster of 2017. Modernist architecture and its successors are so awful that it hardly requires any powers of judgment to perceive it. It's like seeing a TV evangelist and feeling queasy. But modernist architecture, despite its patent hideousness, and its inhumanity still has its defenders, especially in the purlieus of architectural schools. But the population has been browbeaten into believing that there was never any alternative, and it's obvious that to undo the damage will take decades. Untold determination will be required and enormous expenditure. Removing the Tour Montparnasse alone would probably cost several billion but no one's prepared to make this colossal effort. Walter Godfrey wrote in 1954, it's not an exaggeration to say that nine men out of 10 have lost all sensitiveness to an art that was once a matter of common interest. And that, I think, is because people have been desensitized. Desensitized by the ugliness that has been deliberately created. If it's true, it's because they've been taught to accept or to swallow what they're given. The rashes of graffiti suggest to me that, at least subliminally, some still take notice of their surroundings and are affected by them. Defacements overwhelmingly of hideous Corbusian surfaces, that's to say of what Corbusier called my friendly concrete. And now we have insanity. 
You get gold medals from the RIB for doing stuff like this. It leaks, it's useless, can't be used for anything, and it's an insult. It's, in fact, an insult to the rest of us. Like, going to the opera now is something one takes one's heart in one's hand and quakes, because it's usually an insult to a composer, to a librettist, and most of all, to the audience. So, I wrote a book to warn what was happening. Outside, you can see the modern environment in all its hideousness. Death comes at last to ring the tocsin. Harold Wilson, Prime Minister, all over the country, the grime, muddle, and decay of our Victorian heritage is being replaced and the quality of urban life uplifted. That's the reality. That is what modernism has created. Vulgarity, hideousness, ugliness, something that's insupportable. I rest my case.